Welcome to a Prevent Connect podcast, where we explore the prevention of violence against women. This is a project of the California Coalition Against Sexual Assault. Hi. Okay. I did not expect us to have such a packed room, but we're going to run with it. Um, so my name is Sky. I use any gender pronouns. Am I too loud or too quiet or anything? Good. Okay. Um, so I'm going to, we have like 15 minutes of PowerPoint. I'm going to run through pretty quickly. Just, I want to make sure that we're on kind of a baseline about what we're doing today. Cause I realize there's probably a lot of people in the room who've never even heard of pedagogy of the oppressed. Um, and then I have a warm up activity and then a longer activity that we'll do for most of the workshop today. Uh, so really quickly, I work for the Multicultural Efforts to End Sexual Assault, which is a program that does primary prevention work with predominantly marginalized and underserved communities across Indiana. I work with an amazing supervisor named Kimber Nicoletti, who I feel like she knows everybody, so I feel like you all probably already know her. If not, she's doing two workshops at this conference. You should definitely meet her. She does incredible stuff. Um, I also wanted to mention that we, I had a co-presenter, Sam Collier, who does a lot of amazing work in Wisconsin through an organization she created called Team Teal, um, but she couldn't be here today. Ironically, she couldn't get off work, so she's still in Wisconsin till tomorrow, um, but she will be here if you want to meet her, and I, I have her contact information at the end of the PowerPoint. Um, one last thing is there's a bunch of printed resources. Please feel free to take the rest of the resources if you didn't get some or anything, because it's less that I have to fly back to Indiana. Um, and if you didn't get a jump drive, uh, please feel free to get in contact with me um, and I'm happy to send you everything and anything. Okay, so I'm gonna start off uh, just briefly explaining what is Pedagogy of the Oppressed and Theater of the Oppressed. So Pedagogy and Theater of the Oppressed are uh, frameworks for doing uh, different types of education. So uh, the, what you need to know about Pedagogy of the Oppressed is that at its root, it, it talks about how to do anti-oppressive education. So uh, the person who created this is Paolo Freire, um, and he talks about, for example, um, that education should be centered on multiply marginalized experiences. Um, and for example, uh, whenever we talk about mainstream education in the US, what is the impact of doing the type of education that we do with indigenous youth, um, and, and also particularly like indigenous youth who also uh, don't have a history with or don't identify with the way that colonialism has imposed a gender binary. So there's multiple level, layers of identities, histories, and politics that are always happening in education. So Pedagogy of the Oppressed at its root says, we need to talk about those things, and we need to actively work to dismantle the systems that result in harm towards people systemically and systematically. So in thinking about that, it also talks obviously about how learning is non-neutral. Um, and a really good example of that that's happening right now in Texas is uh, there's the Mexican American Heritage textbook that's trying to be passed, but it's like a very horrifying endeavor. Um, and it's being passed as like a neutral and supportive type of learning and textbook, but obviously it's not written from the perspective of the people that it's written about, okay? So this is again where learning and politics meet. Um, the last thing that I think is incredibly important is doing any type of pedagogy or theater of the oppressed is to recognize that learning uh, and education are reciprocal. So I'm talking at you for just a moment, but the rest of the day will be us learning and teaching together. Um, and then, the, just so in case you want to look up more, uh, Freire talks about education in which students are blank slates, the way that a lot of education is done, particularly in the US, as banking method education, as if students are white, blank slates, and they just need to have information deposited into them. <laughs> but in reality, everyone comes to their education with their own experiences and histories and politics and everything else, okay? So, the, so Pedagogy of the Oppressed talks about the fact that we're not blank slates, we all contribute to our own education and contribute to teaching each other as well. So we're all student teachers. Theater of the Oppressed is a way to do experiential learning and it's what we'll do today. Um, and it focuses on uh, applying pedagogy of the oppressed through non-traditional forms of theater. The reason it's non-traditional is because, uh, sorry, theater of the oppressed uh, says that um, 
that there, are, there should not be spectators and actors that are separated. Spectators should be spect actors, and actors should also be spect actors. Everyone should have the opportunity to participate and to influence the outcomes of the theater. Does that make sense so far? Okay. Um, I had a few handouts of this cutout. Um, I just want this tree to be able to give you a bit of framework. We don't at all have time to go in depth about this, but I wanted to include this in the PowerPoint that you could have a copy of or um, later receive from me so that uh, a lot of times I found whenever I'm getting into new fields or learning about something, the language itself is a huge barrier because everyone's talking about the same thing, but each field has created its own language around what that means. So this is a really great way to enter into theater of the oppressed. Like these are the words. <laughs> um, today we'll be specifically focusing a lot on image theater. Um, and so the reason I wanted to start there was because I realized a lot of people won't have a lot of background in this and I have more experience in image theater than a lot of these other modalities. Um, and image theater relies on our ability to produce images, sounds, and words um, in order to convey oppressive systems and dismantle them and recreate them in a way that hopefully is not oppressive or less oppressive or anti-oppressive um, using our own experiences. Uh, the two things that I think are most important about image theater is that it offers an opportunity to address something that Augusto Boal, the creator of Theater of the Oppressed, calls the cops in the head, which is that each of us has internalized our own oppressions and dominance in different ways, and in order to do critical education, we have to be aware of those and address them on a daily basis, um, hopefully with compassion and also critique. So uh, it allows us to be more uh, reflective about our internalized dominance and marginalization. And then the other thing that's really important is it allows us to explore and reveal our desires. So this is important because I think a lot of times in prevention work, in sexual violence prevention work, we talk about all the things that don't work. We need to address unhealthy masculinity and rape culture and all these things that are very valid and true and we need to do those. But I think a lot of times in workshops we get so focused on the concrete what is what should not be happening that it's hard to imagine what should be happening. What do we replace that with? So I really appreciate that Image Theater gives us an opportunity to actually imagine what those desires and what those positive realities could look like. So we'll do both of those today. Do people have any questions about PO or TO? Okay. I also wanted to quickly mention, I got really excited about this and I forgot to actually say what my background is. I don't know if it matters to y'all, but I'm just gonna really quickly mention, uh, because I think our positionality, both in identity and history matters to how we do education and how we do this work. Um, so I was gonna say, I, I've been doing community organizing for about nine years. I got into sexual violence prevention and like public health and social change work more actively in education about four years ago, and it's been fantastic and an amazing learning curve. <laughs> so um, that's kind of my background. I predominantly have worked with um, LGBTQ folks and undocumented communities in Texas, and now I do LGBTQ sexual violence prevention in Indiana for the last four years. Okay. All right, um, so just I just want this slide in case uh, people are not very familiar with sexual violence prevention. Whenever I first got into sexual violence prevention, there were so many acronyms, I had no idea what anyone was saying. It was like we were just reciting weird algorithms of the alphabet over and over. Um, so I just wanted to quickly mention that a lot of people follow a public health model of primary prevention and social change, which just means that there are multiple layers of interactions that we can address social change at, right? So there's like the internalized things um, or the skills that we have that might be positive and help. There's also the relationships we have that might contribute to uh, healthier relationships or not. And then all of those also um, impact the way that we lead organizations and institutions. I know there's a very large problem now that is not new um, that exists in sexual violence prevention in which organizations do not operate in a way that is anti-violent themselves, even if they're doing anti-violent work. So I think it's really important to recognize that these layers are kind of arbitrary, but they also feed into each other. Okay, so a couple of things about ethics I wanna make sure I address before we all disperse. Um, like I said, it's really important to try to read and apprentice these things. ptoweb.org has uh, a lot of great resources. And I'm actually on the PTO board if you also have questions or wanna be connected to people. Um, we also actually have a member directory online that would allow you to connect to people who do pedagogy and theater of the oppressed in your area so you can look those folks up. Um, I wanna re-emphasize how important positionality is when doing this work. Um, so 
I want to be conscious that whenever people break the rules of games, they always have a reason. And the rules are only there, the rules themselves often serve a function. So if I say no talking and someone still talks, I'm never gonna reprimand them. I just wanna know why maybe, you know, or talk about how did that change the activity or the game for you. Um, and so the way that I approach a lot of this, it's really important for me to be cognizant both of what it, what it, how am I experiencing oppression and privilege, but also how is that being conveyed to other people? Um, an example of this is that I'm on the autism spectrum, and so the way that I communicate, I get told a lot I'm very articulate. I'm not saying that I am, but I get told that a lot. Um, and what people don't see is the amount of effort I've put into making sure that I can communicate in a way that people will understand. Um, and so I don't come off as somebody necessarily with a learning disability or with other disabilities and injuries or whatever, right? Um, so I need to make sure I'm cognizant of how that power dynamic plays out in settings and the fact that because I've worked on this so hard, I often sound like somebody who's very formally educated, even though I'm not. <laughs> but I still wanna make sure I'm cognizant of what that means to people in the workshop who think that I am and how I can mediate my language in a way that will be more approachable and um, digestible to people, those kinds of things. Um, also, whenever you're, if you're ever facilitating one of these types of things, um, some people, some people who are much more experienced jokers than I am, or facilitators who have done TO for a long time, um, often suggest starting out with yes, no questions, because people are more willing to make the risk of saying yes or no than answering open-ended questions. I didn't do that a whole lot because we were on a, a time restraint, so I typically asked open-ended, like, how do you feel, or what, what did you think, or whatever, but some people might ask, like, did that seem realistic, yes or no? And if someone says no, then you can ask them why and it helps start a conversation. Um, last thing is, okay, something that's really important that's a much larger concept, but I just wanna mention it is that we aren't playing these games to objectively repeat what is already in the world. The reason that it's valuable to do allegorical or metaphorical skits and images is because they already have so much information about what is really happening, not necessarily what looks realistic from a dominant perspective, right? I hope that makes sense. If not, please come talk to me. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm saying that uh, theater of the oppressed should be used to have a real perspective, something that is a real experience, but is not necessarily realism. We aren't trying to recreate what already is. We're trying to figure out how we can change it. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is disability. Um, a lot of times I get questions about how to do these types of games with people with various disabilities. And obviously it's a much longer question than I can answer right now, and I'm sure other people also have different viewpoints. A couple of things I wanted to mention though was that a lot of, Boal talks about these games as being de-mechanizing. Our brains are mechanized to the way the system works. Like, when I come to this conference and present, I probably should have worn a button down, but I was like, no, I'm gonna wear a shirt that says, throw glitter, not shade. <laughs> you know, like, I don't, I don't wanna go to conferences and be a part of making it hyper-professional and inaccessible for people, right? So I'm gonna wear a t-shirt. Um, but, but the point is, is that, I don't even know where I was going with that, but I'm just, I really like this shirt, I just got it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, but the point is just, you know, that um, I know we're about to close. So disability, uh, one thing I want to mention is that it is important to figure out how people can participate actively, but de-mechanization. So our, our minds and bodies are mechanized to exist in a certain way. So sometimes doing these types of activities that get us outside of our comfort zone or outside of what is our norm also helps de-mechanize our minds and bodies simultaneously. I want to, I want to emphasize that they don't, they're not separate things. Things. So sometimes doing something that's outside of the scope of your body can be helpful for your mind. Similarly, because these are about figuring out what are the limitations and possibilities of our bodies, um, I try to encourage people to figure that out for themselves. You know, I'm not gonna dictate people based on their visible disability how they're going to participate. I invite everyone to participate and they can figure out how that works for their body. Um, similarly, one thing I was gonna mention, because I figured this out, I have uh, different disabilities and whenever I first started doing TO, I would try, I would get really frustrated whenever the facilitator would be like, don't talk, just do it. And I'd be like, no, but I wanna tell them I can't move this way or something. And I figured out pretty quickly whenever I started doing that, that it was really frustrating for me because then it put, it put the responsibility of my well-being on somebody else and I didn't get to have control over that anymore. They were more concerned with how I could move than I was, you know? So I think also there's a level of empowerment that happens in terms of disability in being able to control and choose how you move and work um, and that being able to do that is also really helpful because it's helped me learn how to assert what I can and can't do, you know? Yeah, does that make sense? Okay. 
I think that is the end. There's contact info. Thanks. Thank you for listening to this Prevent Connect podcast. Prevent Connect is a project of the California Coalition Against Sexual Assault with funding from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The views presented on Prevent Connect are not necessarily the views of the United States government, the CDC, or CalCASA. To learn more about Prevent Connect, visit www.preventconnect.org. For more information about CalCASA's mission or to show your support, visit calcasa.org. That's C-A-L-C-A-S-A dot O-R-G.